So one common question that comes up when you're dealing with matters of elven fairy and whatnot is the uh, interdimensional space-time. Because uh, clearly, if we're dealing with a logical uh, relationship with the nature of fairyland, somehow we're going to have to get around to quantum subjects, which bodes well, actually, since we are also posting um, some videos onto quantum subjects and whatnot. So, where in fact are these beings if um, they're not here? So when they transition from another world, what is the nature of this other world? What is the nature of fairyland? Um, surely if you were to dig up the mounds, like, you know, you hear about the, uh, the fairy mounds and whatnot. Surely if you were to dig up the mounds beneath the earth, and um, it would be nice if you didn't do that. Um, but we would not find their physical forms whatsoever. Uh, naturally, the nature of fairyland is easiest to understand, perhaps, with this kind of quantum met metaphysical background, or the idea of, you know, string theories and uh, Flatland uh, is another good example. You pick up Flatland. It's a really good introduction to uh, dimensional theories. So, you know, for those who haven't had preview of this type of knowledge beforehand, you, know, you want to make sure you really try to meditate on this information until that kind of understanding comes forth. Because this new old paradigm is what makes it possible to understand the nature of the creatures of fairy. Um, so this otherworld elven fairy who are pushed out of mortal time space that are not currently in the third dimensional existence that have not um, that are not transitioned here presently. So those uh, uh, are separate from what we call like uh, elves and dragon kings and wizards and uh, the scions of, of the elven way <coughs> that are manifest, materialized uh, in simulacrum in the physical world. Two completely different things. Um, so, when it comes to these uh, contact with the other world, now there are there are methods of contacting the other world, but nowhere in the lore of even medieval grimoires is there an actual conjuration rite such as that which sorcerers have used to bind and command other types of spiritual entities. Um, there's no conjuration right of, of elven fairy as far as elemental beings and the other world. And this probably is a letdown to foolish seekers who expect to find such a spell to command the fairy to do their bidding, um, which would make them no better than the Milesians who thought to enslave the race for the same purposes. Um, such inclinations um, are not really part of elven wizardry whatsoever. Um, now, there's another little letdown as far as those who rely on the absolute and finite to process their experience. There's no real way to map or chart the regions and geography of the other world. At the very least, it would require the ability to, you know, graph ridiculous dimensions um, within a single point of space. So, uh, some mystics and scholars have simplified the abstraction, implying that the other world is just simply a duplicate of the physical world, just existing on a higher vibration or frequency. This introduces the idea of a polydimensional or multidimensional reality and inhabitants with the ability or property of integrating or transitioning um, into the physical world at will or at or through certain natural thresholds. The subject of time is difficult to capture pertaining to the other world or well, even in general, but past accounts would suggest like a year in fairyland is equivalent to seven earth years, like a dog, you know, or something. Um, and this is only one suggestion because other stories report people staying in the other world for long periods of time, even years, 
yet returning to their world with seemingly only moments having gone by. So this subjective time-space characteristic has been often misunderstood or ignored in ages past. It's uh, very significant, however, when studying the nature of this interdimensional other world. Uh, the elven fairy or shit, even the misunderstood gray aliens. So, at any rate, by accepting this new old fairyland paradigm, a seeker will uncover answers once overlooked by the contemporary world concerning the universe as a whole. Uh, and when I generalize about contemporary science, um, I don't include things like quantum quantum metaphysics, and I uh, wish to clarify this, because the field and research of quantum physics, and even that which is brought forth in the pop culture, you know, such as in What the Bleep Do We Know, um, it continued to be seen as pseudoscience until contemporary scientists finally reach their limits and start asking us, you know, for example, the best way to use quartz to make a computer chip and work with ethereal forces in society once again. What exactly was the artifact known as the Holy Grail? Was civilization created by beings that were more than human? Does the so-called Grail bloodline descend not just from Jesus Christ, but also from the biblical figure of Cain? Who are the original Grail Kings? And what is the nature of the ancient conflict that has shaped thousands of years of human history? What does all of this have to do with the bizarre little church in a tiny village in southern France? Hi, I'm author Tracy R. Twyman. In my book, The Merovingian Mythos and the Mystery of Rinle Chateau, I sum up the results of almost a decade of research into these questions. And the outcome is not what you would expect. The heroes and the villains are not who you might presume them to be, for the Holy Grail is a treasure both sacred and cursed bestowing knowledge of both good and of evil. This story goes all the way back to the fall of Lucifer from heaven and the fall of man from the Garden of Eden. It leads to a hole in the center of the earth known as the Cave of Treasures. To unlock these secrets for yourself, pick up a copy of the Merovingian Mythos by me, Tracy R. Twyman, at Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, or TracyRTwyman.com. Soon your eyes too shall be opened, and you will be as gods, knowing good and evil.